Hey, this is Stu, and of course, I'm at beautiful Purple Valley, and we've managed to catch Ty Lundgren at the end of his retreat before he jets off somewhere nice and exotic, even more exotic. And we, today we thought we'd actually talk about twists as a group of postures, because there's plenty of things that can be problematic for students. Some people find it very easy to twist, some people find it's a complete nightmare. I would be in the second category. And so there's lots that we can talk about, and often it's, it's not like a... It's not a sexy group of postures, is it? It's not like jump throughs or back bends and things like that. So they often get sort of left behind, I think. We don't mm -hmm. often talk a lot about twists, but mm -hmm. there's a good amount of information, uh, useful information that we can uh, think about when we're thinking about twists. Yeah. So Ty, you're gonna use some examples, aren't you, to, to examine mm -hmm. the, the particular concepts that you're thinking about. Mm -hmm. Can you share with us some of the ideas behind the way you approach twists? Sure. I mean, so I, th I think that one of the most important aspects of twists is to really stay connected to the sort of aponic root of the pose. Um, and by that I mean to actually sort of embody the elements of the apana or the exhale pattern in the body, which involves a sort of um, a, a, a slight posterior tilt in the pelvis the gentle sort of drawing up of the very end of the tailbone, the coccyx, up into the pelvic floor, and a sort of um, uh, an overall sort of movement of sensation, you know, from the lower reaches of the body upward into the center of the pelvis. So if we can sort of um, connect with that, then we can give a much greater support to the very sort of pranic spreading pattern that's... Um, you know, that, that we associate with twisting. Up in the chest and up in the thoracic mm -hmm. area. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So um, we might think of the diaphragm as being the sort of threshold between the aponic and the pranic zones. And so um, in the particular way of twisting that, that I connect with, um, we s s really activate the apana below the diaphragm and then try to connect with the more spreading, expansive pattern above it. Okay, and so that plays out in, as you say, a bit of a posterior tilt in the... Ty's uh -huh. smiling because we had a little bit of a talk before, um, b before this about, and what do you think of twisting? And I'm saying, well, um, uh, yeah. So, but, you know, there's going to be lots of different views, isn't there, as far mm -hmm. as how you do any posture. And this is mm -hmm. really, I think, a nice exploration that you can, can play with as well if it's not your way of, of doing things. Uh -huh. And so there's definitely, you'll see, a, like, a, a dropping back of the pelvis and a, a little bit of a rounding of the, the low back. Yeah. And the point behind that is you, you mentioned the, the apanic uh, energy, yeah. but also you were talking about the sacrum as far as feeling that it gives a little bit more space, maybe? Right. So on a, on a sort of anatomical level, um, the, the activation of this aponic form will help to uh, s spread the two sides of the pelvis, um, s the, the two sides of the ilium, away from the sacral triangle. And um, so we can imagine, you know, the, the sacral triangle being at the very base of the spine. So the spine is extending up like this. And if we, if we start to tilt the pelvis forward by dropping the pubic bone and lifting the tailbone, the sides of the, of the pelvis will start to press in toward the upper corners of the sacral triangle, like this. Okay. S and if, then if we're trying to twist and the two sides of the ilium are pressing into the sacral triangle, then that triangle isn't going to be really free to move. Now, as we were discussing, it doesn't move very much, mm. right? Like maybe three degrees maximum mm. in the most as far flexible As far as counter-nutation goes, uh -huh. yeah. And, um, it, it, well, and it also doesn't move much this way, way or that way. Yeah. It doesn't really rotate on its, on its vertical axis uh, very much. Um, however, um, even, if it's, it's, even if the movement is very small, if the joint is being compressed and the sacrum can't move at all, it will send a signal all up and down the back for the back to sort of, you know, to sort of tighten up, mm -hmm. right? Um, whereas if that, you know, precisely because movement in a locked joint will, will, will sort of do damage to uh, 
the, you know, the soft tissues that, that, you know, mediate the relationship between uh, the, the different bones. So the idea here is to, by activating the eponic support of the post, to sort of open up the sides of the, of the sacro, you know, the, 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 the sacroiliac joint in a lateral direction so that uh, the top of the sacrum can sort of, you know, move back a little bit and then there's also more room for it to, to move within the joint, okay? Um, and then a sort of uh, a third uh, element um, is to allow the sides of the pelvis to move uh, with the twist as well. So what I have in mind is that, you know, when you're walking and, um, you know, you step forward, with the right with the right foot, there's a, there's a, the, the pelvis wants to wants to sort of turn like this mm -hmm. as you walk. It wants to the two sides of the pelvis want to sort of rock a little bit like this. And you know if you similarly if you reach back to grab something like in the back seat of your car, you know the 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 inside pelvic bone is going to want to roll back a little bit to go with the twist. And it's, so it's just a sort of very natural movement that, that gives space for the sacrum to, to turn on this axis and also on this one so that there's the maximum amount of freedom in the joint. So this approach to twisting is sort of all based on trying to maintain that sort of that natural movement natural pattern. Moving. And also reduces the amount of twisting that's going to happen further up if you've got a change in the alignment of the pelvis then to reach around. You, it's not going to be so far if that Oh, I see, I see. Back. Right. Then yeah. the, the thoracic spine, which yeah. naturally flex, uh, you know, rotates, rotates, provides greater uh, range of motion in that sort of torsional direction, will not have to reach around as much to do mm. something like take a particular bind. But I think working with the pelvis in this way, it certainly in no way limits the amount of torsion that you can get mm. in the upper spine. And if anything, I think it increases it because I really think that, and this is sort of just experiential admittedly, but that when the SI joint is locked up, you sort of feel this tension that goes all the way up the spine. Um, like the spine doesn't want to move because it doesn't want the sacral triangle grinding against the sides of the pelvis. Hmm. Through that mo so when I release like this, I find that even the, the, you know, the upper spine, the thoracic spine is, tends to move very, you know, through the same range of motion um, more freely and, um, and ultimately uh, it, can, it, it, can, it can, that range of motion is even greater. Yeah. So what, what posture do you want to start with? To so I thought we'd start with Marichi Asana C. Uh -huh. And um, so again, admittedly, you know, this approach uh, to the posture is um, maybe slightly unconventional or mm -hmm. I don't know you get different you know you get different perspectives on how these postures should be arranged you sometimes hear that it's important to square the pelvis forward and to keep it squared forward as you twist so um, I'm pointedly asking you to sort of contradict that advice although <laughs> yeah, you know yeah. I can ex I can Back it up. I can relate <laughs> to the perspective that it's coming from, but here's just a, 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 di a very different method. You can try this and see how it feels in your body. And, you know, if it feels right, then you, you can uh, adopt And you're starting with this, with this foot in line with the... the so I've the got this rotate. foot lined up more or less with the outside of the pelvis. Uh -huh. And that's not, you know, that's not super vital. I mean, you could have it a little bit out like this or a little bit in like this kind of depending on what the natural, uh, you know, geometry of your own hip joint is, but somewhere uh, more or less in line with the pelvis is good. And then before I start this twist, I'm going to reach forward through the left leg okay. and allow the pelvis to turn a little bit in the direction that I'm going to twist. Okay. okay. Just like that. So now your foot's moved to the outside of your pelvis. Uh-huh. It's moved out a little bit. <laughs> mm. and, and at the same time, I'm going to drop the tail, let the tailbone be heavy, and I'm going to gently lift the pubic bone up so that I'm creating flexion in the lower spine. And that's going to help me sort of connect with these, this aponic uh, base of the pose. And then I'm going to lean way back so that my rib cage can come around to the outside 
of this leg, and I just scooted my foot forward a little bit naturally so that I have a little bit more space. And then I'm going to press forward, and I'm just going to show this pose without reaching around and catching. So you can, of course, catch, but um, that's not essential to the pose. So just to keep it simple, I'm going to just talk about it from here. Um, so I keep the tailbone dropped. I'm reaching forward a little bit. Now my sacrum's moving with the twist. So then from feeling that strong base of support, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep the, the tailbone dropped. And then when I inhale, and I'm going to sit up more, but I'm going to sit up just from the diaphragm up. I'm not going to push my sitting bones back like this because that will constrict the movement of the sacrum in the way that I had just previously described. So instead, I'm going to, on the inhale, I'm going to lift from the plane of the diaphragm. On the exhale, I might twist a little deeper. Inhale, I lift. Exhale, twist a little deeper. Inhale, lift. Exhale, twist a little deeper. And as I do this, there's a natural, you know, I can, I, I'll sort of create a little bit of counteraction by pulling the heel and the sitting bone toward each other. Right? And of course, if you bind, you could create that counteraction with the arm. With the arm if right. you reach around, you can sort of, you know, as I squeeze with the arm, that pulls this hip back forward a little bit. I'm not squeezing it back to square it off. I'm just creating a little bit of, of counteraction to that movement of the sacrum, which helps give more stability to the base. And as far as the sit bone of the bent leg, is this, is, does it need to be down? Or it not? doesn't need to be down. My, I happen to have the flexibility to keep it down. If you can keep it down, it's nice because it keeps the pelvis balanced. But it's totally acceptable in my opinion, to lift the sitting bone up like this. In fact, it might feel better on you even if you can get the sitting bone down. So you can also do the pose like that. Cool. And if you've got an action with this leg moving out, yeah. are you okay with it moving across the center line? No, I don't want it to move too far over the center line. You want to kind of, that's, that's another piece of the, of the uh, sort of counter action of the pose is that you press back this way to keep this knee from collapsing over the midline. If it starts to collapse over the midline, you might feel a sort of pinching sensation mm -hmm. on the inside of the hip, which is pretty common and not terribly pleasant. So you just sort of push back in the opposite direction a little bit there, like that. And then you've got something a bit more to push off against to make the twist, whereas if you come this way, you might kind of collapse. Yeah, yeah. So this gives you a really firm, you know, something to press against. Hmm. As you twist and lift. Cool. Oh. Good. Okay. All right. Yeah. So then I thought I'd show um, Arda Matsi and from the uh -huh. second series, which is a, a, a very classic pose. And um, so you'd only see this, or only be used to this, if you actually reached into second. So right. it comes after the little backbending sequence, doesn't it? Like a third or so in. Yep, yep. Mm. Um, and um, so maybe I'll just turn this way just to show it from a second side. So in this pose, you know, you, you, you step the right foot over and bring the right heel close to the outside of the left hip. The left foot steps over uh, the right knee. This is the second side of the pose, but just thought it would make sense mm. to show Camera a twist from the easy. other direction yeah, exactly. or something. Um, so, um, and sometimes I like to sort of scoot this hip into the heel a little bit just to help create even more external tibial rotation because that feels good on my knee. And you can sort of play with that if you like. But then the idea is going to be basically the same. I'm going to reach back. I'm going to drop the tailbone, lift, roll the pubic bone up toward the navel so that I'm creating the, the aponic form. And then I'm going to twist and try to bring my navel as far as I can to the outside of the leg before pressing back forward to close the gap. So I close the gap between the back of my shoulder and the knee. And then I can reach forward here for the inside of the foot. Take even the thumb to the inside, if possible, so that you're grabbing sort of just in front of the 
medial arch of the foot. Okay? And then this arm can wrap around and catch the inside of the foot like this. So now one thing that's a little bit distinctive about this pose and really nice is that you can emphasize the, the sort of aponic squeezing of the pose by pulling your sitting bones and coccyx on the one hand and the front heel on the other toward one another. So you're sort of in, you sort of engage the, in this case it's my left hamstring, uh -huh. which is the hamstring of the, of the sort of raised knee. I'm going to engage that and at the same time engage the musculature just above the pubic bone so I give a little bit more of a stronger Uddiyana Bandha lift and that's going to pull the heel and the coccyx toward each other. And as I do that, it gives me more lift. So by activating that sort of aponic root, I get the, the pranic pattern starts to sort of bloom and expand. So particularly, I might emphasize that squeezing as I inhale. And then as I exhale, I might deepen the twist. So. And again, you've let that sit bone move forward relative to this one. Exactly. And similar to as you did with uh, Marici C. Right. So I'm just, uh, I'm allowing the pelvis <coughs> to, to move with the twist um, for the sake of freeing up the sacroiliac joint. Yeah. So another thing about that pose, I mean, I was emphasizing that, that sort of, you know, the, the what, what we call axial extension of the spine, which is extension right through the axial line. So it's not extension in the sense of back bending, but in the sense of elongating the spine. Now, the, um, the fibers in the discs between the bones of our back run vertically. So if you have a disc that's here, the fibers go like that, which means that if you take, t if you're, if you, if you have some torsion in the bones, then those, that disc is, those fibers are going to sort of be pulled into a diagonal line and that's going to, and that's going to shorten the disc. It's going to compress it. Mm -hmm. So inherent to, to twisting is a sort of compressive action to the disc. So we have to consciously you know, readjust for that by creating as much axial extension as we can in the twist. And so I also find that having a really strong aponic base to the pose helps to create that axial extension. And so I hope that was demonstrated by that sort of squeezing action of the tailbone toward the heel and that lifting. helps us, mm. yeah, lift up a little bit more. Cool. And then, how does that differ? So we're going to look as well at, at uh, Paravita Trikonasana, aren't we? Yeah. And so, uh, this, how do the same principles apply to that? The pelvis, you're letting that side of the pelvis drop down? Yeah, so for, so for revolved triangle, I'm going to allow the, uh, you know, what would be the outside hip to move downward toward the floor and the inside hip to come up as I twist so that I'm moving the whole pelvis with the twist, again, to create more space laterally across the front of the sacrum. Yeah. And then I'm going to, with a strong sort of, you know, by, by squeezing the pelvic floor and rolling the pubic bone up toward the navel and letting the tailbone drop, I'm going to create a little posterior tilt in the pelvis and also sort of create that overall sort of squeezing a ponic pattern that pulls sensation from the lower half of the body up into the pelvic floor. So I'm going to find all that first, and then and only then I'm going to reach from the base of the pelvis up the axial line of the spine, twisting as I go. Okay. Hmm? Yeah, cool. Shall we see what that looks sure. like? Okay. <clears throat> okay. So I'm also. I like to take sort of a, a little bit of a wider stance. <clears throat> and the hand's going to come down to just to the outside of the foot. Now before I start to twist, I'm going to let the tailbone drop. I'm going to lift the pubic bone up toward the navel. Okay? And my left hip, the hip that's closest to this door, is going to 
is gonna, I'm gonna let it just naturally drop down as much as it likes. And I'm, so that my outside hip, so the hip that's closest to the camera, is gonna be lifted up a little bit higher, like this. I'm not gonna worry about leveling out the pelvis like that. Because that'll pull me out of the aponic form a little bit. Instead, I'm gonna just worry about really finding that apana and then allowing the pelvis to move with the twist. So on an exhale, I'll set the tone in the pelvic floor. And then as I inhale, I'm gonna start to twist from the base up. And then once I've got you know, about as much twist as I can get through that action, I'll use the outside of my hand against my foot to pull the bottom shoulder that way to open up this pranic zone, to open up the heart more, I'll roll the collarbones back, roll the shoulders back, and open up that inhale pattern. So here we go. So another thing that I did is once I came all the way up into the fullness of the twist, I found a little more external rotation in the back leg. Mm -hmm. And so that's a counteraction to the dropping forward of the left hip. So it, that lifts the left hip back up a little bit, but the point in doing that is not to try and level the pelvis back up, but just to create a little bit of counteraction. So it's like often we're doing that in most postures, isn't it? We've got one action and then we're There's integrating always a all by yeah, doing something in the opposite way. Right. Yeah, cool. Yeah. And so are there certain things when you're walking around the shala because you're working predominantly in a Mysore situation uh -huh. that draw your eyes to what you're seeing in the shala when people are doing something different in the twist? Perhaps you can pick up on some of the things that you often see that you think, okay, It'd yeah, be nicer sure. if you did this instead. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, there's a tendency for many people to keep the sitting bones lifted pretty high as they, as they go down to set up, uh, you know, the, all of the standing postures to kind of go like this. Yeah. And then to keep the sitting bones lifted really high and try to twist from there without dropping the tailbone and finding that sort of that, you know, that, that basic energetic <sighs> aponic form. And then, you know, when that happens, that's a sort of telltale sign, you know, that, that they're a little bit less connected to the legs. So that usually makes the pose a little more wobbly. Whereas if I drop like this, my feet press more into the floor and away from each other. And then I f r feel really rooted in that upward facing triangle, which is the lower triangle. Yeah. Right? So that one's really clear. The other thing is that people will often sort of tuck their chin and like look way this way uh -huh. and look up. It's important in these poses to bring the spine back along the, the sort of the, the medial line of the pose, the yeah. line that's, that's, that would be more or less bisecting your mat. So once you come up into it, you can take your head back so that it comes over that sort of imaginary line, so over the foot. And then you can turn and try to see your hand with both eyes. Yeah. So as I'm looking down the length of your body, your, your head is, is center between in your pelvis. Yeah. It's not over here somewhere, which happens right. both in Paravrita and Trikonasana, where it's mm. taken out from the center line. Mm, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I also think that um, oftentimes if people take a stance that's too short, and you know, there are different schools of thought about how far apart your feet should go. One common rule of thumb is to have them three feet apart. Um, three of your own feet, or three feet in measurement? I always thought it was three 12 inch segments, <laughs> but I. Three of your own feet. But yeah, but what about someone with different length legs? You know? Yeah, exactly. Because you're going to so have long legs and small feet. So yeah, so the rule of thumb that, that, that Richard Freeman, my teacher, uh, likes to give is, is to use the length of one of your legs. That makes much more sense. Yeah, yeah. so, um, you know, so for me it would be probably about like that. Now, if you don't do that, it, you're going to be pitched really far forward over your front leg. Mm -hmm. The back leg's going to be sort of disconnected. That lower facing triangle is not going to be very solid. You know, it's kind of wobbly there. 
Yeah. It, there's not a lot of that basic sort of mulabanda pattern, which is a pattern that focuses on the pelvic floor, but can really involve, you know, the the sort of a concerted effort of the entire body. I mean, I think of mulabanda as an, as a matter of pulling sensation from the lower part of the body up into the pelvic floor and then allowing it to sort of rise up through the midline. So the way that you uh, position your legs and your feet can have a huge impact on that sensation pattern. Yes. And, you know, for me, having the feet apart, uh, at least uh, the length of one of the legs, really helps with that, as does, as we just mentioned, keeping the spine right along the medial line of the pose, keeping the head in line with the rest of the pelvis as you reach. And so f for you, we, we quite often, you know, we're often in these videos demonstrating with people mm -hmm. that can, can do the postures easily. Mm. And, and so it's nice sometimes to think also about those people that find it like really difficult to even get into the position you're getting into. Yeah, sure. So for those people that are newer to the practice and starting mm -hmm. with twisting and twisting is maybe difficult for mm -hmm, them, mm -hmm. how can they uh, accommodate that into what you're suggesting? So where would they put their hand if they're having trouble reaching the floor or, or that sort of thing? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, a block can be really helpful. You can put your hand on a block. Uh -huh. it, it can be on the outside if you have enough twist. If you don't, you can put it on the inside so that you've created almost a sort of tripod type action. Yeah. And then you can turn this way. And then, you know, only if you have the stability, you can start to reach that arm up. And you can get a really nice twist like that. All the same elements apply. You're setting the legs in such a way that you have a really firm upward facing triangle. You're allowing the coccyx to drop and the pubic bone to lift. You're twisting from the base of the pelvis all the way up and doing this all in sequence so that you're building the pose from the ground up and then allowing that prana pattern to expand out from the heart as you inhale. And you were sort of mentioning the same with the seated postures that the binding bit is not so important as uh, the fact that you're actually twisting. Right. Not to forget the fact it's a twist. Yeah, I, mm. I, that, that's right. I mean, the binding is, the binding is, it definitely adds something energetically if you can do it, but you don't want to sort of sacrifice the whole overall mulabanda pattern for the sake of binding, yeah. which sometimes happens where, you know, you're binding, and, but you're just barely binding, and so the face is contorted, and the, the breath popping. is complete. <laughs> yeah, the shoulders are, the collarbones are <laughs> bursting out forward and out. Um, so, you know, oftentimes it's, it's, it's better to sort of soften a bit yeah. <laughs> in yeah. most situations. And, um, you know, to reconnect with the breath, to reconnect with the movement of sensation toward the pelvic floor, and then to, you know, especially in twists, to think of this, to think of twists as the, the energetic pattern is one of sort of spiraling up from that root support. So spiraling from a really well-set base, a well-set pelvis up the spine, and then trying to open the inhale pattern as much as the inhale pattern sort of wants to open, as much as is available in that moment, by rolling the collarbones back, keeping the chin lifted, this helps to stimulate Udana Vayu, which is the Vayu that sort of holds the body up when you're awake and sort of retreats when you go to sleep so that the body melts down. You want to keep that stimulated, keep the eyes looking off on the horizon so that you don't, you know, slump down. Mm. Um, but even on a, a very stiff body, all of those uh, internal um, energetic elements of the practice are just as accessible uh, the, uh, than they are to a person that has a very Yeah, rather than just the body. outside appearance of the posture. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, brilliant, cool. Yeah. So thanks so much, Ty. And you know, there's plenty, like with every type of posture, there's plenty of different ideas about way things should be done. Um, so have a play, if you feel like it, with this uh, methodology and, and see how it works for your body. Because like with everything, some things will work really well and some things won't. And you can always seek out Thai for more clarification wherever you are in the world, because you get around a bit too, don't you? I am getting around a lot these days, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's cool. Thanks, okay, hope you enjoyed that. Take Thank care. You.